So we'll probably get uh, a few other people coming soon. I love everything about wood. My name's Tim. And uh, as I see this empty roll at the front, I get involved in all sorts of different things with wood. And one time I bought a bunch of pews from an old church. And I was trying to get the different people I know who respected and loved wood. They were from the 1870s. My sister-in-law said to me, can I get one that was at the front? Because I know it's never been used. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get a few people stuck in the front here because they're late. So thank you very much for coming today. We are going to talk a little bit about forests in Canada. We're hearing a lot more about forests and wood. Um, those in the architectural and design community probably hear a lot about mass timber and cross-laminated timber or structural timber. I thought it'd be great to start a presentation in this building. This is an old barn that was built in the 1840s, and we relocated and put it back up here. And what inspiration for people um, think about building a structure that was used for utilitarian purposes. It was so beautiful that a couple, almost 200 years later, someone wanted to take it down and put it back up. It's a beautiful example of great joinery. It was, uh, again, built in the late uh, 1840s. It's all white pine timbers. And it's a five bent barn that uh, was hand hewn with just a few hand tools. And we were able to put it back together um, many, many, many years later. And all we did was replace the white oak pegs with new white oak pegs. And it clicked together beautifully. The five bents are connected with 60 foot long, 12 by 12 white pine timbers. And all the mortise and tenon joinery, all the rafters just clicked into place beautifully. So it was the one of the original um, mass timber structural buildings in Ontario. But we're talking a lot more about these sort of timbers. Come on in. Thank you. Have a seat. And um, we are pleased to have Etienne with us. Etienne with, works with the Forest Products Association of Canada. He's a forest scientist. And there's a few different universities in Canada that have great programs. University of Laval is one. UBC is another. And there's a few others. But Etienne is passionate about managing forests, and we as an organization like to buy from mills that manage forests well. We find that every mill owner we've met is also very passionate about managing forests well because it's their lifeline and their lifeblood. They're engaging with indigenous communities and so on. Uh, so I'm going to ask Etienne to take us through his program. You'll probably have lots of questions at the end of it, um, but we're trying to give you a picture of where Canadian forests are at right now. Sadly, we still are importing cross-laminated timbers and other mass timber components from Europe, um, even though we have these wonderful forests here, and we'll learn a little bit about why that's the case. So, Etienne, thank you very much for coming with and being with us today. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for the kind words. Bonjour tout le monde. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Etienne Belanger, coming from South Quebec. I would also like to say quoi quoi as we want to acknowledge that we're on the territory, uh, traditional territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, indigenous reconciliation is a growingly key and important part of what the forest sector focuses on. So I wanted to make sure uh, to mention that and we'll come back to it about how Indigenous people are currently participating in the sector uh, in the country uh, through the presentation. You'll see that I jump from subject to the next uh, all true. So if there's something you want to come back to, uh, note it, then happy to come back to it in, in questions. Um, so, I'm sure it makes it work. I played with video before, so it's moving around. Uh, the Forest Product Association is uh, an association of companies. We currently have 20, if I remember right, a uh, member company uh, across the country from uh, BC to the Maritimes. Uh, that represents a little more in volume and economy size of all the uh, primary uh, manufacturers in the country doing solid wood products, as well as pulp and paper products, which is roughly half and half of what the uh, forest sector uh, does in terms of first transformation products. Um, we are their voice uh, to the federal government or their national voice and also international as there's a lot of international process that influence um, uh, how uh, forests are um, commercialized and, and, and who buys what. It's also a 200,000 uh, employee sector uh, for direct job, 600,000 for indirect jobs, so very significant as, as being uh, for the last 200 years uh, an important economic sector of our country. 
So wood construction is booming in Canada. Uh, it's increasing as well as elsewhere in the world. The pavilion Jean H. Kruger, as you see here at Laval University where I've studied forestry, has not only been a great example of climate-friendly building, but it's also one of the research hub for uh, wood engineering and wood construction. And that's fairly recent and that's an area uh, where there, there's more and more capacity to support engineers and, and architects in how to make uh, better use of wood, which I'm sure you'll know uh, even better than I do, how uh, wood is an interesting material to building with, including that it's flexible, aesthetic, fire resistant, and uh, a green solution as uh, the only or one of the very few renewable product that uh, you get to use. So it's the, it's a renewable product. It's uh, typically locally sourced, although we still have challenge with uh, producing enough mass timber and CLT uh, in Canada compared to Europe. But uh, very importantly, it's also, and I'm sure you know that, a material that sequesters carbon. In fact, wood is comprised of 50% carbon uh, by dry weight. So approximately one cubic meter wood uh, holds about one ton of CO2 equivalent, uh, which is very significant. And when you can sequester it for 200 years, that's a very significant thing for the atmosphere. Uh, like the building we're in. So the development of new performance products, new processes, new innovation system have contributed to the increase of wood in construction and the potential is, is, is exciting, it's beyond exciting. And we're moving also beyond a certain hesitancy uh, with regard to the technical properties of wood and are starting to understand that maybe there's no height limit when building with wood but only a psychological a limit. So what if? What if we would build every uh, building from wood? Then quickly appears that there are other psychological limits about how much wood we can use sustainably and it raises a legitimate question. If we start using wood in every construction or to replace also, which is an option, all petroleum-based products with biomass or biomaterials, Will we be cutting down the Earth's lawn? The concern is valid, and it reflects the complexity of working with a living material compared to, to other alternatives. Wood is only renewable and sustainable if, if it is sustainably sourced. And at the moment, deforestation, all due, luckily its rates have been reducing over the last decade is still a very important issue in the world's forest. And you'll see that losing forests uh, is still happening faster than gaining new forests. And should also note that the forests we gain are rarely as biodiverse as the forests we lose. And this is not managing forests, this is forests uh, going away because deforestation is a permanent thing. We'll come back to it. Um, so, so there's good questions. So that's why, among other initiatives, in 2021 at the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, UK, uh, which was COP26, the leaders of the country made a declaration in a climate conference, which was specifically about forest and land use, which speaks to what would be sustainable commodity production and trade. So it includes the following commitments, to conserve forests and accelerate their restoration, as well as to promote sustainable commodity production and consumption that do not drive to deforestation and land degradation. So two tenements were uh, often find a ways to consume, produce, and share uh, without getting at these tenements. So we need to know what they are, how to track them, how to get away from them. Regarding deforestation, we know pretty well what we're talking about. The major deforestation fronts, I mean, we can track them by satellite, so it's been well researched and, and tracked over many, many years since the mid 90s. It's a big topic. Uh, they're primarily taking place in the tropics. And then, depending on the driver of deforestations, which, which vary, and you have a, oh, lots of options here that might lead to deforestation. So, if you know the type of wood you're buying, and you know where it is coming from, then you can assess the level of risk of sourcing from a deforested area. 
we'll come back to this as one of the very important things that forest certification uh, addresses and tracks and that can inform you about uh, your, your supply chain. In Canada, deforestation is tracked by the National Deforestation Monitoring System. And um, that deforested area is reported every year, uh, notably in the States of Canada's Forest Annual Report, which we'll also cover in more detail later. Um, worth knowing for, uh, to give a scale sense that we also, in that report, uh, report on other disturbance types. So areas affected every year by insects uh, is very uh, significant. That's part of how our um, ecosystems naturally are renewed uh, through uh, wind damage, through insect damage, or to, uh, to wildfires. We harvest uh, a portion of our forest every year, which if you look at the dot and the percentage remains pretty small because we use, uh, we, we harvest at the rate that the tree grow. We have a lot of uh, forests in relatively cold environment that will grow relatively slowly, which speaks for a slow rate of harvest. Uh, but when it comes to deforestation, uh, that's pretty small, 49,000 hectares in a year that would be 0.01% of our forest per year. So overall, if we go back to natural disturbance versus harvest, the scale is that on the, in, in average, the natural disturbance will impact 25 times more area than what we harvest. So you have to look at the combined impacts when you seek to establish what is the rate at which you can harvest sustainably. Um, just to uh, reinforce that point, the, uh, it's important to note that most, all the other disturbances here except deforestations, which can all be sometimes uh, covered under the terms of forest cover loss, are not permanent and are not considered deforestation. Deforestation in its most case human made. Uh, it's defined as the permanent clearing of forests to make way for new non-forest land uses, such as agriculture, and urban expansion. Quick note, because you all have heard a lot about it last year and probably will this year again, while we're on disturbance, I'll note that the area burn, uh, it does vary a lot per year, depending on the climate. Um, here I'm adding a new circle to show how significant the 18 million hectare burn last year was. This was 5% of our forest, which is very significant. That's recurred year, obviously. Um, and at such rate, uh, it would be a uh, return cycle of 20 years, um, which, uh, which would uh, be much more intense and problematic than the natural fire cycle. Um, so if you want to learn more, <clears throat> and I won't focus too much today on that, so happy to take questions, but if you want to learn more on how Canada's forest mm -hmm. sector can support wildfire resilience, as well as reducing fire risk. Happy to invite you to visit our website and download one of our latest publication on the subject, or we can come back to it later. Uh, but back to ensuring first criteria from earlier, to not drive deforestation and degradation as we source wood. So we have 9% of the world's forest, that, that's huge. Um, regarding deforestation, we're responsible for less than half of 1% of the global deforestation uh, happening. And in Canada, if we look at the different causes of deforestation, well, that's uh, going to be uh, largely due to agriculture, which is still expanding, uh, then mining oil and gas, uh, which is also um, on an ongoing uh, expansion, and the build-up environment. Depending on the year, you might have significant hydroelectric projects that will lead to deforestation, but that is typically uh, pretty small. And you see that forestry is in there. Uh, while forestry is when we harvest and we follow it by regeneration, either through natural regeneration or through planting, uh, this, is, this is not permanent and therefore not considered as deforestation. If we're still here, it's because uh, we are creating uh, new permanent forestry roads 
uh, still every year, and other persistent clearings such as sizable landings, the areas where we might pile wood on the side of the roads. And um, while there are more and more reclamation uh, programs in practice to remove these roads um, as we follow harvest, uh, the public and a lot of First Nations do appreciate the road network uh, and the access to new areas. And we don't always have, therefore, the latitude in the public for us to remove all the roads we might wish for uh, environmental purposes. So there's social use of these roads, there's economic use of these roads. So we still have that, that footprint of deforestation, which is uh, very, very small. Um, as, as forester, our primary interest is obviously to maintain forest cover as opposed to lose it and do what we might call forest mining, which is log and run and don't care about the future. Um, <clears throat> so now, uh, let's see if we can also shed some light, because deforestation, we, we have a good sense from how it's happening, where it's happening, and who's responsible for it. Um, but let's see if we can shed some light on the last concept here uh, that is used in more and more procurement policies, both public procurement policies created by states and private procurement policies created by, by big organizations, uh, degradation. There are multiple ways to define degradation, uh, which largely depend on what you're focusing on. Uh, depends on the perspective you bring to the question, what's your, your interest? To me, the simplest and most credible way to define it is to say that basically degradation is the flip side of sustainable forest management, which we over decades have spent considerable effort in defining over, uh, over time and in different processes. So if you achieve sustainable forest management, you are not degrading. And if you're degrading, your, your practice are not sustainable. So you should be basically looking at the same criteria. And it's either your success or your failure that will determine if you are sustainable or, or performing degradation. So let's start by going back to basics, because I, I like to, to go back in time and history. Uh, scientific forestry roots were forests developed in Europe in the 17th and 18th century in response to, at the time, a growing awareness of the depletion of timber resources. So uh, George Ludwig Harding founded one of the first dedicated schools of forestry in Europe and is well remembered for having coined the following definition of sustainable yield. In order for wood supply to be continuous over generations, harvest should not exceed growth. So the forest foresters were called forest geometers. It was the guys who would go in the forest to measure the forest. And the task was to measure tree growth so as to be able over time to predict growth of an entire forest so that you don't harvest more volume each year than what the entire forest would be giving. Like out, cashing out your annual interest but not touching your capital is the proper analogy. Interestingly, that concept, which still guides how annual wood supply are calculated, was very influential in the discussion of the World's Commission on Environment and Development, which coined the notion of sustainable development in the mid-80s. Um, being sustainable development is development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own need. And we, since then, are trying to strike that balance. While we're on international environment and development discussion, and since sustainable forest management is about many more dimensions than just wood supply, let's mention the Rio Summit of 92, which uh, was a turning point for how humanity defined its interaction with planet. Uh, many important conventions signed at the Rio Summit, one on climate, one on biodiversity, desertification, they tried to sign one on forests and were not successful, largely in part uh, because of the uh, incredibly important variation in uh, the forests on the globe and how they're managed differently and hard to come to consensus on what is a sustainable approach and practice. And also because developed country tried to have less developed country to lock their forests up and not touch them, which seemed very unfair to the less developed countries. So there was no universal international definition of sustainable forest management agreed at that time. Uh, but the, f the scope of sustainable forest management uh, even continues to uh, evolve all the time. But 
uh, lots of initiatives started to put their own definition out right after that, 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 that failure. So we were not able to define it all together internationally. Uh, so a lot of players uh, made their regional definition, uh, including on the same year, the International Tropical Timber Organization created their guidelines for sustainable forest management and other uh, regional processes started. The one that is influential for Canada was the Montreal process, launched in 94, immediately after, and it uh, was set on the task to develop the criteria and indicators to cover temperate and boreal uh, forests, which are the two types of forests that we have in Canada. Uh, there's 12 uh, countries uh, that uh, today represent uh, a third of the entire world population and uh, that reports on over 80% of all of the world's temperate and boreal forests. So it is still uh, a leading process to continue to evolve the different criteria and indicators that we look at to determine whether or not our practice are sustainable. Uh, these are as follows uh, in terms of the current one, they've been evolving, but uh, they're up to seven criteria now, starting with conservation of biological diversity, uh, then productive capacity, uh, the ecosystem health, uh, soil and water has always been a very important focus of how to assess whether or not you're sustainable. One forester rule of thumb is to look at how you're doing in terms of your road building, are you creating erosion? Are you sending uh, dirt and uh, erosion in your waterways? So the quality of the water flowing out of a harvested area is a good metric to look at some of your baseline practice. Uh, contribution to global carbon cycles is, is how you're, you're carbon positive or not in the way you manage your forests. Obviously it's multi-dimensional, so it's not only the environment, but social economic benefits are also important to ensure that you're sustainable, as well as following legal frameworks, uh, including uh, respecting indigenous rights of, of local population. So how does it transpire and work in Canada? Well, that's very important to note because that's not necessarily where we live in the reality that is the closest to us. But 94% uh, of our land is publicly owned, largely by the provincial governments. That's, that's how the constitution was set up. Uh, but the, and we'll see a map of it later, but the, uh, the population, 90% uh, of us live nearby the, uh, the US frontier and on private lands. So a lot of what takes place in industrial commercial forestry is going to be on public land that is a little remote from the uh, core population centers in the country. Uh, so that creates a bit of a, a division in how we experience forests and how uh, they're managed in the landscape operation, uh, the, the large scale operation. So uh, because for our forests are public, because we are one of the country that exploits public forests, as opposed, for example, to the US, where most commercial forestry takes place on private land at smaller scale, uh, you have to uh, work through uh, many layers of uh, regulations to, uh, to get your forest management plan in place. Uh, which is typically built at three different levels, starting with a landscape strategic plan, which is a huge advantage for marking on public land. You get to manage a forest with a large landscape perspective over a long-term period, as opposed to only have one tiny piece of land there that it's yours and that you might cut in full when it's ready, but don't have a connection to the broader landscapes to measure how you're doing with regard to different criteria of sustainable forest management. Um, so it plays out in three levels of plans. In the public forest, the large strategic plan that might be a 25-year plan, the uh, tactical level plan that says, well, I will be setting my operations over this area for the next five to 10 years uh, because there, uh, I have critical mass of, of supply that will be ready to harvest and I don't want to be building roads everywhere across my entire uh, landscape, which won't be cost effective and will also have more of an environmental footprint. And then you have your annual plan, which gets precision to how exactly you're going to do it, harvest the forest, build a road, and renew the forest after. Uh, for all of these plans, you have to respect the federal legislation that 
look at uh, cross provincial matters, including migratory birds, uh, where it's governed by a multi uh, country agreement. Um, the provincial regulations, legislations are key. That's the primary driver of how forestry is conducted. Uh, more than the three quarter of our forests are currently certified to uh, third party forest management certification. That's a voluntary measure that's been uh, embraced by the Canadian forest sector. And we since have uh, been the country that certified most of its practice on the, on the area base. Each company is to align all these practices and their own policies. Uh, community involvement and indigenous involvement is important uh, for, at, each, uh, at each plan's development. And uh, indigenous rights have, have, have special considerations in how both legislations are set and, and implemented. And then you need to make all of that work in the plan. You're going to submit as an RFP, a, regist a registered professional forester, which in most provinces is a uh, a governing trade, which you uh, can only oppose your signature uh, if you meet certain criteria, and that is to be approved by the government. Then, so that's uh, how it, it is structured. It doesn't look nice. Uh, we have a lot of uh, <laughs> so that's that's an actual example with uh, covering the uh, the federal uh, on the left and then the BC regulation on the right. Uh, so you have to, to make all of these works, uh, which is a bit of a challenge. Making a forest management plan takes a little more than two years to give you an idea of the level of complexity compared to just uh, turn in your backyard and harvest when it's ready. Um, let's mention that in the 90s, an important turn that was also done. So not only did we set international criteria for what is sustainable, a lot of our you know, provincial policies were set in the 90s around that, that time of a lot of international discussion around forestry. And the way uh, the two key things were, 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 were added to most provincial policies, one being focusing on ecosystem-based management. So uh, trying to create a forestry that uh, works with and aligns with how the ecosystem evolves. Uh, and setting targets so as to maintain that naturality to the ecosystem. The other one being the insertion of public participation in a large way in how we manage these large public forests. So ecosystem-based management uh, can be defined in a way with, with the two-filter approach, which is one, one way to describe it, where you'll, you'll try to uh, mimic natural disturbance, so as recreate the same landscape as it was before harvest. You, you uh, model what your regeneration will create after our years of studying different types of intervention and how they can be regenerated. And then you, you try to, uh, to be part of the disturbance in the landscape. So with fire, with insects, and with harvesting, you reduce the fire by taking a lot of these out and then you compensate by harvesting and you try to maintain a natural rate of disturbance so as to recreate uh, an environment that would be similar to one that you would not have touched in the first place. And that's your coal shelter where, and through that you'll be able to maintain most of your value, most of your species, but for some it might not work exactly as you might wish and you need to also track species by species value or uh, given special sites and so on. So you also have that fine filter where you, aside from maintaining globally the ecosystem as it should have been, you also need special consideration to, to give in values. Uh, the forest sector contribution to woodland recovery, caribou, uh, caribou recovery is a report that gives some of these uh, examples of what are the different types of action that industry is taking uh, as a fine filter way to, uh, to help with, with caribou recovery because they are not faring well with uh, human presence and have been uh, a flagship uh, species at risk for, for many years on which we do quite a lot of work. Um, an example then of the coarse filter approach that is huge widely across Canada uh, is to, as I said, men base your harvest the way you harvest on, on, on what a fire would look like. And that's what we do in the boreal forest, which is a large part, I'll show a map of it, of, of our country. So top left is a fire, and you see the different uh, density or intensities 
uh, burnt across. It's not, it's not a big square block, obviously. So then we harvest in a way that uh, seems to be uh, similar. So on the right is the uh, uh, previously harvested areas. You can see some of the roads uh, that was done to, to mimic fire impacts. And then you try, you set your targets to stay within what we call the natural range of variation. And you, you study your landscape, say, am I, am, do I have too much old forest? Do I have too young, young forest? Am I losing white pine? And then you, you will manage uh, towards these objectives to try to bring back always the forest towards what would have been its natural course. And that's a Canadian way of doing. It's not necessarily how it's done across the planet. And then we always have significant interna international debate to explain that to people as uh, there are other approaches out there, which uh, I could get into. So all these different objectives that we have when we set our forest management plan, like you, you, you almost you manage for all the value and then you go and harvest where you might still have the opportunity to do so. So in average, because we apply what we might describe as conservation forestry, uh, you will have lots of set aside for different reasons, whether it be for wetlands, uh, illegal protected areas, or to deal with different species of trees like a, a bald eagle that you've spotted. Uh, so overall, it's a little more than half in average of the managed area. So an area that is designated to, for wood supply management and, and harvesting. A little more than half of that area is typically set aside and will not be subject to harvest. <coughs> uh, so overall, because it's not everywhere that we manage, like that's the light green, a lot of our forests are either too far north or are in sensitive areas or have not been designated for harvest. So a lot of our forests will never be subjected to forestry. They're too far from market, too much transportation costs. They don't grow fast enough. So we have a lot of forests that will always remain untouched. And in the managed area, as just mentioned, there's a lot of set aside. So overall, that's less than 25% of Canada's forests that is available to harvest, um, which going back to earlier point, we manage at around an 80 year cycle. We harvest 0.02%, so you see the math there. Like if we harvest a quarter of our forest on a 100-year cycle, that's why we only harvest 0.02% of our forest trees. 0.2, sorry. So yeah, just want to share that. Uh, that was a bit of the lay of the land, uh, but there's many ways in which how we define sustainable forest management keeps evolving. I mean, we work with nature, we work with living organism. Uh, it's not, a, it's not, it's not rock, rocket science, it's, it's much more complicated. You're, you're not only dealing with, with map, you're dealing with an ecosystem. So you, you plan, you monitor, and you adapt. You, you go on that, that cycle of testing and, and, and adjusting over time based on your research and your finding, etc. And one way to do that, that has been interesting, and notably because it's been adopted in a big way in Canada, is uh, third-party forest management certification. So they're, they're, they're non-government governments, market-driven governments, we call it. So that's going and get your uh, seal of approval on your product, either FSC, SFI, PFC, CSA. So it's groups of experts, groups of people, groups of stakeholders, groups of rights holders that come together to develop and make evolve standard over time, uh, depending on, on the multi-interest based decision making models. Um, so as and that that's important to go through because that's a big part of how our practice evolved in Canada. And that's also because we are uh, by far the leading player in implementing forest management certification in Canada. So this is this has been embraced and is now very influential in our practices. Uh, here you have the distribution of the countries that had the most certified area. Obviously, they don't have all the same forest area in the first place, but the U.S. have almost the same area as we do. But because they're small-scale private ownership, it's much more challenging to implement uh, large-scale sustainable practices. Um, and I'm sure they would present it differently than I do. Uh, Russia was huge, but since the conflict, all their wood has been decertified. Uh, 
And well, they were used, but that was questionable. But uh, that's, uh, that's another story. Um, so, as mentioned, third party forest management certification is voluntary. Uh, so, it's available for the organizations that want to demonstrate their corporate responsibility. Uh, and it's uh, an independent certification you get against a standard. So, there's standard setting as for the uh, voting picture of the team, and then you have, you, you get <clears throat> an auditor to come and audit your practice to see if you're meeting the standard. Uh, in Canada, there are three forest certifications that are available. The uh, Forest Stewardship Council, FSC, which comes from the international. The uh, program for the endorsement of forest certification, uh, PEFC, which is built differently. It's a program that was built to have the international brand, but what they do is they set standard on how they recognize and endorse national standards, like the Canadian Standard Association standard was uh, approved and endorsed by PFC. So you can either use the CSA logo or the PFC logo. In fact, you can't use the CSA logo because they, no, they don't have a, a logos uh, program for, for that, and they're now uh, moving their program standard to PFC itself. So it's going to be PFC Canada in the future, detail. Um, NSFI, which comes from the North America Sustainable Forestry Initiative, uh, which uh, covers only Canada and the US. Um, and the origin of the standards is important, I think, to know as to understand uh, them better. The uh, North American standards were designed assuming that the uh, regulations were in place and uh, were appropriate. So often there are some criteria that they did not put directly in the certification as being already covered because their standard only applies either to Canada or Canada US. So sometimes you might find a longer list of subjects covered in FSC because they also, that one was meant to be applied in any context, including in areas where regulations were pretty weak. Uh, so they were uh, built differently. But they all set high thresholds that forestry company must clear uh, in addition to Canada's tough regulatory regard requirements. Um, and one more thing important to note, um, there's two types of certification you need to be able to get your tag on the product. You need the forest management to be certified, and you also need the chain of custody to be certified at each point of the uh, chain of custody. And if you have both, then uh, you can get the logo on the product. Um, and that's, here is uh, how we present the different uh, criteria that are covered. So we've seen the, the seven criteria earlier. That's a different way to put it. That's a list of the different uh, elements of sustainable forest mange that are covered uh, by, these, uh, by each of these three standards. Uh, I won't necessarily uh, re read all of them uh, to you, but if you are curious and interested about that, these 17 elements and how each standard addresses them is covered in our publication about forest certification in Canada, which presents a program, there's similar trees and achievement. And there's gonna be that table at the end showing these different elements and how they're uh, addressed or where to find how, where they're addressed in the different standards. That's resource that you can find on Certification Canada website, which is also a place where you can uh, search for certified product or uh, inquire about given forests and see what they are certified to if you are um, wanting to know more about the different public forests managed nearby you. Uh, you'll see what, what, what certifications have been adopted by different players and get access to their certification reports as well. So um, that's uh, also where we, uh, on, a, on an annual basis, maintain uh, statistics about uh, how certifications embrace in Canada. Uh, and for fun facts, at the moment, it's 11% of the world's forests which are certified, uh, which is uh, relatively thin. And we have a over a third of that, 35, 37% of all the certified area. And it's three quarter of our managed forests in Canada, which are certified. Uh, some uh, won't adopt the voluntary uh, need, either 
because they might not have the scale to manage the costs or because they don't have international customers asking for it. Uh, that's voluntary, so, so it's not something that the uh, government will force upon them. We as an association have made the commitments, so all our members have to be third party certified uh, to be part of the association. And that contributed to uh, the growth in the early 2000s for certification in Canada. So um, I want to spend more time on how we're, we're doing. So we, we spend a lot of time discussing what's the criteria we're managing to. We'll try to also cover how we're doing uh, with regards to these criteria. I'll start with a bit of international context to place our Canadian forests. So, so where are we at among these three trillion trees in the, country, in the world and the different uh, forest types? So the main forest type in the world, uh, south of the equator, is, is tropical forest. That's what we have the most of. Interesting. Uh, we manage more boreal forests. That's where uh, more products come out of the boreal, all due to their smaller. Development uh, and, and complexity of managing tropical forests is a, is a different game. Uh, so see, Canada, that's, as mentioned earlier, we have boreal, a lot of it, and temperate, some of it. That's uh, in the US, they, they get the tree style, but in Canada, it's boreal and some temperate, which is close by. Like that's what we like. Out here would be a temperate forest, not a boreal one. Um, other comparison with uh, or context setting for Canada and the world. We're third largest forest area by, by the country. First one, obviously Russia, uh, almost uh, no more than twice as large as our forests. Brazil is huge at 500 uh, million hectares. And then uh, Canada, US, China are relatively in the same game. Here is size and the certified area to give a bit of sense of scale and adoption. 57, that was before they lost all their certification in Russia. Um, not moving. Then uh, we have lots. We have large forests, but we we're not we're not the most dense forest in terms of area covered because we have the Arctic. So so a lot of our land base is, is non-forested. Uh, it's uh, it's either uh, taiga or Arctic. So no 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 dense tree cover there. Overall, we're talking about a third, a little more than a third of our land base, which is forested. Um, so less dense than some other countries, some of which are so uh, are entirely covered in forest still, except a few cities. Then if we make the correlation between the population and how much forest we get, then, then it really becomes quite impressive. Uh, as uh, we have one of the world's highest per capita number of trees or forest area. Um, so that's another uh, point <laughs> to, to speak to the fact that we manage our, our large area somewhat uh, lightly. Um, that would be 14 soccer fields per person in terms of how much forest there is in the country for, for each of us. And uh, that's, uh, that's different from, from most of the world. So with that, 9,000 tree per people, uh, when we wonder about can we, can we get more wood, can we use more wood sustainably, then to put things in perspective, so we harvest 0.2% of it per year, 70% only of what we could harvest based on annual wood supply calculation gets harvested, so there's room to grow, and most of it is exported as well. So there's lots of room to use more of it in the country as opposed to uh, only, only being exported. Let's go and start to focus more, drill down on the country itself. Uh, we, we've said, and we now know that we are we have a lot of boreal forests. Well, in boreal forests, you won't have as much uh, deciduous trees. You'll have a lot of spruce and fir, the uh, good old black spruce, like traveling across North Ontario. Uh, that's what you get in a lot of the country, uh, except for the West Coast, which is very, very different. Climate west of the Rockies is uh, much more wet, much more warmer. So forests go all the way uh, north to BC. You get taller trees. Look at the size of the spruce and the cedar. Uh, so so different, different game in BC. Volume-wise, half of the volume harvested in Canada comes from BC. Very uh, important uh, uh, place. And 
for forestry. Uh, put it in number, we, all, we have more than two thirds of our forests that are coniferous uh, than mixed wood and broadleaf. So what I, yeah, what I want, I'll come back to that. What I said earlier about where we live versus the forests that we harvest the most. Uh, so I'm just trying to go back and forth from one another. You see that the forests that most people will experience are in the uh, deciduous or mixed forests, while most of our industry uh, and harvesting volume-wise takes place either uh, in BC, which is its own thing, or in Boreal, which is the, the largest ecosystem we have in the country. So let's talk a little more about the Boreal. Let's talk about old growth and old forests in the Boreal. Uh, it's a fire ecosystem landscape. Fire and insects are, are omnipresent and are uh, making huge disturbance, which the forest is adapted to, at least when fire uh, size, intensity, and rate was, was, was natural. That's been thrown aside a bit with, with climate change. But uh, so, so there was much more mid-year forest uh, because there's a lot of fire, so it's very rare to find the, these pockets of forests that will be able to avoid fire for over 200 years, 150 years. Uh, that's going to be more exceptional and treated differently. But for most, that's an ecosystem that has been based on constant renewal. So uh, to think that putting a legal zone and say that's protected, it, it won't be affected, that, that's not the case. In fact, protected, one of the, the objective of protected areas is to monitor natural disturbance. So it, it does not protect it, it let it go and be attacked or burn, and then you, you, uh, you look at it and see what's the impact, and that, that's an important part of the landscape, but it's not per se a, a disturbance protection strategy, Qu quite the opposite, in fact. Sometimes some of the mine thing pine beetle epidemics was fed by not being able to intervene to block it when it was going through protected areas. Um, and let's now, so that's what's context, what our forests look like. Let's try to go to how we're doing uh, with regard to how sustainable our practice are. Uh, one lead resource for that will be the State of Canada's Forest Annual Report. I'll check the time, please. Get it there. So you have uh, the Montreal Process Criterion Indicators are reported on to uh, these annual reports published by the different countries. For Canada, that's the State of Canada's annual report. I won't go through each of these different criteria, but mention a couple. Uh, one that is quite telling um, is how much we harvest versus how much we could harvest. And we uh, typically, on a given year, and that varies when there was a big economic crash in 2008 and so on, but we typically leave around a third of what we might be technically able to harvest on the table. A uh, good part of that for economic reasons, like we, we have vast forests, but it's not, it's not all accessible. Transportation is a huge cost driver in, in Canadian forestry. Our mills are not sur surrounded by a short crop plantation that goes over a 12 year cycle like in Brazil. We, 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 we run uh, hundreds of kilometers uh, tracks of supply. That's high cost, so a lot of it, based on better economic condition, could increase the capacity for harvest. So that's, that's room to grow. I uh, want to talk just a little about fire because that, that's a huge disturbance that can drive our ability or not to, to, to harvest as much over time. And just to mention that it is a very viable uh, phenomenon that, uh, that might have very low years uh, when it's rainy or higher years. And as we uh, all heard a lot about, I'm adding myself here the 2023 because there's lots of time lag in, in reporting for the state. Uh, you have to change scale completely to uh, incorporate that here. So that, that, that is having an impact on the wood supply. There is regions in the country where they have to diminish the harvest because too, mu too many nature forests that were ready for harvest are not burned. You can salvage part of that. Uh, then the insects will go in and you will never be able to salvage at all. So you have to uh, delay harvest or reduce harvest for, for decades to compensate so that the overall impact does not go beyond what would be sustainable. Um, 
one of the key reasons to build more in wood is, is, is climate change mitigation. So important to, to note that reporting of carbon emission is one of the criteria mentioned earlier. Uh, if you look at everything happening in the forest, it varies quite a lot. And since the early 2000s, we've been on the emission side, for sure. Uh, so that's why, and also to meet international agreements, we need to divide between what is natural and what is human-led. So when we only look at the human-led uh, uh, carbon emission, then we've been a source, and quite a source for some time, now we have more variation and uh, also based on new data that they will produce for this year inventory a lot of these year points will, will now be in the emission a complex story but the more we lose area to fire we don't account for the emission but we we lose areas that contribute to the growth of our forests because we set them aside in the accounting system because that's not human emission you know that's that's how currently international agreements work. But all that to say that the more the forest is disturbed, the less growth that we can account for and then harvest after. So we need to adjust our harvesting. We also need to adjust how much we, see, we report carbon sequestration. So these uh, higher natural disturbance are diminishing a bit our, our sequestration in the forest ability, but that does not in any way change our ability to uh, to also make uh, to have a huge climate advantage by displacing our carbon from other sectors when when we replace and that's not something that uh, we report in international agreement but that's still our choices that have a huge impact uh, when when we look at our practice so that was the how we report on it i think it's also important to note how we uh, Lost the slide there, but uh, I'll get to it. When you look at uh, are we or not having a positive impact for climate, we advocate strongly for uh, using a system perspective. If you're moving, uh, let's say you stop harvest and suddenly you are, you will your forest will be sequestering more, and you focus just on that. That might be a good story. But what about the fact that tomorrow you can't use wood in in, in building and and what else, what else? So you always need to look at how these things uh, interact and work as a full system to have a proper carbon picture. So there's removals and emissions in the forest. There's also carbon that then gets transferred in products. Uh, there is a, a time for which the <coughs> carbon can stay in products, which obviously will be longer uh, with building than with uh, paper. All new paper can still be recycled a number of time around seven to last longer. Uh, when you do use it in construction, as mentioned earlier, you store one time, but when you use it to avoid the use of another uh, GG intensive products, not only are you storing one time, but you're also avoiding the emission of another time. So that in fact uh, is also uh, important to take into account. I won't go in, in all of these details, but if you, uh, as mentioned earlier, living, working with a living material makes for a complex story, complex accounting. So if you want to learn more about um, the roadmap we built for us towards climate change mitigation from the forest product sector, I invite you to, to look at that publication that sets the three following objectives. So reducing our operations emissions, so what we control the most, uh, increasing the carbon that gets stored in forest products and substituting forest products for more energy intensive material, which is some of the biggest contribution we can have, and uh, increasing the resilience and carbon sequestration capacity in our managed forests, which is now put at more and more risk in context of climate change. Question back there. I'm just uh, curious <clears throat> as to whether the government has levied a carbon tax on woods. Uh, yeah, in the manufacturing, it's uh, depending on the, the fuel use. So the, the fuel tax impacts our, our manufacturing. Um, and some mills that have no alternative, for example, to move to natural gas, uh, are heavily impacted at the moment. So that tax is actually levied on gas. 
yeah, it's on the uh, so it's the output price output price based system, the OBPS of the base pricing system. So it's uh, it's manufacturing emissions that are caused by the uh, it's not my primary field of specialty, but that, that's where we are uh, impacted. So it's our operations that are that are impacted, not the uh, there's no let's say carbon tax on the the, the forest carbon in the forest and how that's being moved and transferred. Uh, there are carbon offset protocols being developed to take credit from when you improve the carbon picture of how you manage a forest. At the moment, the big problem is that these carbon offset protocols have only been developed for private forests, not yet for public forests, because they've not sorted the, who owns that carbon. And if the province owns carbon, but the company managed the forest, and it's the company's practice that changed the balance of carbon in the forest, but they don't get the credit because it's owned by the, so it's, uh, it's not resolved, and we don't know yet how it will be. Uh, but that could be even bigger than the manufacturing. So for having clarity on how we take credit for improving the picture of the forest carbon would be huge. To even be allowed to take credit for improving the fire risk picture would be humongous, but that's also far from resolved and very complex to set clear standards that don't have leakage, duplication, and meet these criteria. So, uh, good uh, complex questions. <laughs> Not, but so, uh, I'm skimming, but uh, yeah, it is impacting us, the, the carbon tax. And depending on the region, it, it is a problem. Um, but we see also lots of opportunities to make significant contribution to our net zero goals. And over time, uh, we could talk about reduction of uh, between 20 and 40 some uh, million tons of CO2 equivalent that the sec forest sector could contribute to Canada's target by 2050. A few words on mass timber. I know that I'm getting maybe a bit over time, uh, but want to speak to can we do more mass timber without being unsustainable? Uh, we know we're not the lead player at the moment, it's mostly Europe, so if you look at the mass timber reporting done at the international to where it's done, how the demand's evolving, North America was at around uh, 350 million cubic meter of that product, while Europe was four times as big. Uh, but that amount, if you take the Canadian part of it, we're talking about less than 1% of what we are uh, of our wood supply. So uh, lots of room to use more of our supply towards that product, to displace some of the lumber we ship to the states to <coughs> use more mass timber in the country. So the scale is not, uh, should not be a, a huge concern at this point, and it not, it's not necessarily uh, will be uh, all additional harvest. Even if it was, and we would triple it, we could still use two, three percent uh, more of the 30 of the wood, 30 percent of the wood supply that we leave on the table. But even that, uh, we can also simply displace products we're already doing and using more of them in the country. Uh, to get there, uh, the Transition Accelerator is working on a roadmap uh, on how to do more mass timber. Um, and that's not published yet, but we've been uh, supporting a bit of that work. And so some of the, uh, the draft conclusions uh, include that at the moment we lack uh, the scale necessary. So there, there's lots of different pieces in the supply chain that need to, uh, to, to, to be improved for the the, the grow to be at the scale we need. Uh, we look forward to have more code change. We got some, still need more to, to uh, simplify the use of mass timber. And uh, innovation will be critical to make all of these different pieces uh, lift up. So collaboration between government, industry, and university uh, will, be, will be pretty important. I would be amiss if I not say a few words about the indigenous people's role in forestry. Uh, it's one of the industry that has the most indigenous people's participation in the country, notably because of their, uh, the, the, the area where they live. There's more than 400 communities involved in forestry, uh, 18,000 employees. Uh, most majority of indigenous communities are in or near forests, so, so very logical, but they also are very entrepreneurial in the sector. Over a thousand 
of their business, hiring uh, between 10 and 30 people uh, that uh, are in place. And uh, when we poll indigenous people across the country, as the Indigenous Resource Network did, to know how they look at forestry, it is uh, which fisheries the uh, industry the most uh, has supported and, and appreciated. Um, and it's not only workers and businesses, it's now also a lot of the wood supply that is owned and managed and being transferred uh, to land settlements and other means uh, to the First Nations directly. So now more than 10% of the wood supplies in their hand that's uh, that's constant increase, that's been a huge increase of 135% since the early 2000s. That's something that the National Aboriginal Forestry Association uh, reports on. And uh, I'll stop there for now. Thank you all. Thank you, Etienne. So hopefully coming out of this, some of my people come up to me and say, why is wood so expensive? I hope you come to me and say, why is wood so cheap? After seeing what it takes to get a piece of five quarter by six seater decking from BC to here, and we engage with a lot of different um, mills and the amount of work they go to um, provide a forest management plan to the province and um, get the wood harvested properly to uh, replant. In BC, the companies that are replanting are required to look after those seedlings for seven years after they plant them, there uh, a lot of work goes into making sure our forests are healthy. Um, Etienne, are you able to ask answer a few questions for us? Any sure. questions from the floor? No, we'll depend on the question. Yeah, we'll try. <laughs> we'll try. Yeah. So, um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, sure. It was uh, great, and when you guys are managing forests, uh, obviously wetlands are taken into account. Yep. Now, what if someone were to hypothetically um, like make a, a hydro dam? something on their private property and flood a wetland, uh, but like not take any of the uh, uh, the, uh, the trees down or like do any uh, harvesting itself, but like you still have to go through that management plan to, uh, you know. So on private property, the, is that the context? Uh, so like, like it would be hydro dam on private property, but yep. affecting public, or uh, yeah, public property as well. Oh wow, that's, that's quite a case. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how that works. Uh, so on private properties, it's going to be governed by the municipality and the province. The interplay between private and public, that's, uh, that's going to be, uh, I don't know how that's treated. I guess you'll have to meet both requirements then. Um, one thing fun about uh, damming is that uh, well, it's not fun, but the, the trees that are left underwater will, will rub very slowly, but they emit methane rather than, than carbon. So that's a, that's, a, that's a pretty bad practice. You try to harvest the trees before creating the dam so as to recover the carbon. But in terms of the inter, the, the, the inter impact between private and, and public, uh, I, I would think that would the legal frame around it will vary in the country. I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, great presentation, thank you. Uh, in your list of members there, I have to uh, uh, note that there were, I didn't see any uh, major cedar, Western Red Cedar yep. distributors or mills as part of that. So your figures that you're using, would that include Western Red Cedar as well as hardwoods in Canada? Or is that just SPF? Yeah, I've only uh, presented national <laughs> figures that would include mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, the uh, association world is... Uh, is complex so we are the we we have the federal government mandate uh western cedar have their own association in bc so they would do most of their, their work to a different association there's also provincial association in most provinces because provincial regulations are so important so we don't get the mandate to represent in the industry at the provincial level other players do that so we would work with them in different circumstances either when a federal thing affects them so, so yes, the figures would include the entire sector and the membership structure is, uh, is variable across the, the country. It also depends on the, the size of the business and their capacity to engage with multiple associations or to focus on, on the one they, they, they think most relevant. Any other questions? Yes. Um, kind of clarification plus a question. So when a company is managing a plot of land, and they're rotating their harvest, yep. if you will. Yep. They're going to 
have areas that are sectioned off for future hardware, correct? Yep. So do those companies, if you will, manage outside factors that can damage their um, harvest, if you will? Like insects was a large um, yep. cause of forest loss. So are they taking measures to deter insects from damaging their crops, if you will? Yep. And what effects do those products have on other wildlife and ecosystems, etc.? Yeah, good question. Uh, so yes and no. There are some of the natural disturbance that are let go and, and are part of, uh, they're pre-accounted for, so you you assume that there will be disturbance. Uh, there are some that you uh, will have the objective to, to try to reduce and control, uh, but that's typically going to be uh, led and guided by the provincial government that will, uh, that will put programs in place either around fire, obviously, is something that every year is addressed, and priority areas are, are, are protected and other fires are let go. Uh, insects, a bit of the same, where there are some epidemics that are addressed because either they will have too much of an impact or they come from invasive species that could have catastrophic impact. Um, then with regard to the products being used, when, when used, which is not always the case, you can do, uh, sometimes you just go and harvest the trees that are being infested so as to remove the insect population and recover the wood before it decays. Uh, when you use products, then the, the products quality will, will vary depending on on, uh, on what you need and how the insects behave and whether or not it's on the tree, on the leaves, or in the bark. And sometimes you cannot do much, really. Uh, so these products have to be all approved by, by uh, I think it's Health Canada that, 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 that pre-approves product. The one we spray the most... Uh, would be uh, Roundup, so glyphosate, but that's not for insect purposes, that's for vegetation management. Um, and there's lots of efforts to move away from, from that one and use uh, alternatives. Uh, there's some problems that either don't use it, have banned it, or have programs to use alternative measures. So it really depends on, then on the products. That's a question you often get when you consult with the public. And uh, there's lots also of uh, mitigation measures where you might decide not to use any products in given areas, either where there are um, uh, food picking or human presence or so on. So that, that, that's a complex matter, but that keeps being raised and also evolve in time depending on the, uh, the options to, uh, to mitigate the impact. So just to really quickly follow up sure. on that. So you say with the high fire loss from last year, the acceptable collateral legislation will say, well, we have to protect these lots and maintain them for every year. So, so they'll do two main things. When in a given region there's been too much fire, they will uh, ask that all harvesters start by salvaging the, the, the burnt wood first before harvesting green wood, so as to reduce the overall impact. Uh, and, but then if there was too much fire, they will also reduce the amount of wood that the province uh, allows being harvested because the rate, uh, the future projection of how much growth you'll get just took a, a big hit and you won't find the volume in the future. So you need to, to reduce harvest now so as to have a flow that is uh, that can be uh, maintained. Yeah, just to add to that, we'll occasionally uh, in, our, in our cedar lifts uh, specifically, you'll open a cedar lift and see a few pieces that have uh, charred edges that would have been from uh, wood that was harvested and uh, weren't cleaned up entirely, but uh, you'll see that as well. So certainly those areas that they're being burned, um, we're still seeing wood that's perfectly good and uh, looks brand new, uh, but it's been through a forest fire and that log wasn't fully consumed. Yeah, which speaks to also the, the challenge of working with your customers for them to be ready to, to use that wood as well. Uh, there's our example of people that are doing CLT where they'll put burned wood in the middle and clean wood around. And so it's a, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that you have to embrace. It's also less safe and it's uh, very challenging on the machinery 
to go and do these harvests, but it's it's very important. And yeah, it's mandated a big to do so. lake fire that last summer in BC. I was there in the fall, and they were harvesting already the burnt timber to try and get the market as quick as possible for yep. checks and splits and rots. Um, and the province will always take much more aggressive action. It's an invasive species like emerald ash borer that devastated our ash trees. But once an invasive species gets in, it's almost impossible to stop. So they're, they're, they're still controlling the, the elm. Yeah. That's that's right. uh, the ash that's being terrible. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, just wondering about uh, future capacity. I mean, with the climate change, and I'm assuming the insect impact will go up, fire fight, you know, fires might go up. Um, and then uh, just think about all the, uh, the push to do more and more construction and work. You know, higher and, and you can cover a bigger part of the market. Um, and I know you said, well, we've got the capacity to grow in there. Um, but I'm just thinking about the, the growth that is attainable within a driving distance that's going to work. Yep. So I'm just wondering about with the push, like, should we be encouraged significantly to really let's do a whole bunch more work? Because we do have that capacity, but the capacity has to be within attainable, marketable uh, Distance. distances. Yep. Because, like Tim mentioned, why we get cedar all the way from the west, for instance. So, so uh, do you have any encouragement for us? Yes, we can handle the future doing dominantly, uh, or at least a much bigger share of the buildings we design that would. Yeah, so, so there's room, as mentioned, at least in the, in transferring to if when you build a market when there is more value the where the wood's going shifts without necessarily uh increasing the harvest so that that's one dimension uh the dimension about future projection of how wood supply will do in a new climate with regard to more fire more insects it does speak to bringing the management closer to community which makes the risk lesser and if you're going to fire protect areas where there, there's human that's uh, gonna become your, your best regions to have that more intensive approach to forestry where you, you maintain healthy forests, reduce your fire risk and continually, continuously harvest close by to your production center. And, and, and there are some forests that are likely to evolve and become different and, 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 and let that semi-natural phenomenon happen because you can't fight it everywhere. Our forests are too vast and our operational capacity cannot treat all forests even in the next 50 years. So bringing back a more intensive approach to forest self close to community and close to production center are policies that we're, um, that we're exploring, pushing towards as a, a new way to look at forest reef because, I mean, this is a, these policies are in, forestry is slow, forestry takes time and, and the policies are, are looking at, uh, makes sense as being implemented over a very long period but it also takes time to to get the attention and, and, and shift that thinking from from where we're at so bringing the, the the operation closer but also producing more locally with more investment because there's going to be more value for these products is part of the solution take these scandinavian countries they get five to times more volume from the damn same ecosystem as we do because they have a different uh, management approach, culture, and they do invest much more investment upfront in how they, they manage and continuously treat forests. They also don't have a fire-driven ecosystem, uh, in part because of how they manage, in part because of the climate they're in. So there, there's ways to uh, manage it uh, differently for the future that will still provide significant volume that can be used to have uh, to, to use wood in, uh, in a growing way in a sustainable way. And Ralph, the other big um, factor is trade policy. So 70% of our wood goes to the states. So if we lessen that, we've got a lot more for ourselves. Maybe don't do it while Donald Trump's president. And, um, uh, you know, I, I suggest a six foot cedar fence all across the border. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. But no, but there, there is, that's a significant issue. So we have, have an ongoing soft wood trade dispute with the U.S., and that actually slows our exports to the U.S., but we could do the reverse if we wanted to uh, slow it even more um, internally. That's something you may have to think about down the road. But I think uh, adopting some of the practices of the Scandinavian countries would be very helpful um, and looking at other models. 
Any other questions? We'll hang around, the channel will hang around. There's lots of lunch, lots of things to see, so please feel free to wander around. Thank you very much for coming out today. Um, we love wood and everything about wood and are glad that you are here to learn more about wood. So thanks very much and thank you again, Etienne. Thank you.